Hello? Hello? Oh, hey, it's quite loud. Um, so I'm going to start my talk in just a second, but I just wanted to let everyone know, in light of the fact that the contrast on the projector is really a bit weak, um, I uploaded the slides, so if you want to pull them onto your own laptop and you can stare at them right in front of your face, uh, that might be helpful. Uh, it's at uh, bit.ly slash capital N, capital L, capital P, the number four beer, NLP for beer. Um, and then you can pull the slides in and you don't have to deal with the screen. It's bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash capital N, capital L, capital P, the number four, beer, B-E-E-R, and that beer is all lowercase. I can repeat again. Did everybody who wants it get it? Yeah? Cool? Coming in? All right. You, 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 yeah, yeah. It's, it's bit.ly slash... NLP, and that's capitalized, four, the number four, and then lowercase b-e-e-r, NLP for beer. Okay, so I'm going to get started by telling you all a little bit about the things that, that keep me up at night. Um, so, so the image on the screen right now, or perhaps on your laptop if you've grabbed the slides, uh, is, is really the sort of summary of my nightmare of existence, right? So you have a lovely bar with lots of beer on offer and almost no quick and easily accessible information about what any of those beers might taste like, right? So, so, and this is a really common sort of information display in a bar in England. Uh, you have a bunch of sort of commercially sensible cask uh, labels uh, that sit on the pumps and maybe some branding on top of a draft pump. And that's, that's all the information you get. So, I don't know, this one's purple. It's got a nice Helvetica font. What does it taste like? I have no idea. Right? So, so here I am, I've got like 30 beers in front of me, only so much alcohol I can shove in my liver in a night, and, and I have to make a choice between all of these things, and I have no, no information to make that choice with, or no, no practical information to make that choice with. Right? So, some of you may recognize this bar, it's lovely, it's in Clerkenwell. Um, so this is, this is my dream, this is from a, a, an unfortunately now out of business uh, uh, bar uh, called Mason and Taylor. This is their paper menu, and it is, it is a lovely piece of of text information about beer. So, so just really quickly, you can sort of go through things and you see they've, got, they've organized things by broad color, which is a really good way to sort of start with beer organization. And then inside each description, which maybe you can't make out in the projector, but inside each description, you have a couple of sentences that roughly walk you through what kind of flavors you can expect, how strong it is in taste, what the ABV is, of course, and how much it costs. Um, and this, this menu is quite quick to parse. You can even do it when you've had a few beers already. You can probably work out what's meant to be going on, this sort of thing. Um, so really what I want to do is talk about ways that we might be able to move from the sort of current state of affairs automatically to a menu that kind of looks like what we just saw, right? Ways that we can harvest the broad intellect of the universe on the web to make good facts about beer that are well organized and easily accessible. You know, it's a dream. So, so today we're going to have a little talk. It's going to be called Taste Great, Less Wordy. Uh, we're going to do some document natural language processing and we're going to do it for beer. Uh, my name is Ben Fields and I work for a little company called Fun and Plausible Solutions and I'm camping right over there for the next few days. So this talk really is about two different things. Um, the first, of course, is beer. Lots and lots of beer. Uh, shelves and shelves of beer, ideally, uh, how you deal with it, how you think about it, and, and how it works. Um, and the second is, is text, and not just text, but the organization of text, and the organization of big works of text. Uh, so, so, and when we, we merge these two things together, and we end up effectively talking about beer reviews. Um, and, and it's worth pointing out that everything that we're going to talk about today can be generalized to other topics. So the things that we are, are sort of talking about specifically with beer, of course, can generalize to other, other beverages. But more than that, 
basically anything that people write about when they write descriptions about items, you can do the kind of stuff we're talking about to those large stacks of descriptions of items and get somewhere to where we're going, right? Um, and all the, t the, the sort of text processing techniques, actually, they generalize beyond text as well. So you can find people who do the kinds of things that we're doing to text to any streams of bytes. So anything that you can chunk up and call those chunks characters and words, you can actually do a lot of the stuff that we're going to be doing to text as such. Uh, people do it to audio and video sometimes, and the effects are strange and interesting. Um, so the other thing that's worth noting, and then we're done with the caveats, is that the talk's really informal. So if there are any academics on these topics in the audience, like we can talk about the details of the stats afterwards, but for the sake of sort of brevity and getting through things and being able to follow everything, I'm going to skim over a lot of the math in a way that's approximately wrong, but is still high level followable. So let's talk about beer. So beer is made of four things, and maybe some additives, but really four things. The first is water. Water is extraordinarily important with beer. The mineral content in the water has a huge effect on what sort of beer you can get, what so how different flavors will work. Uh, most of your beer is water. The second thing is malt. So malt is a cereal grain. It's also used to make whiskey. Uh, and, and really, this is where all of the alcohol, which comes from sugar, comes from the malt. Uh, you can use barley malt most commonly. You can also use rye and wheat and oats. Basically, anything that is a cereal grain, you can turn into beer, and you have to malt it. Hops. Hops are the herb that makes your beer a little bitter. Uh, anything that isn't sweet probably came from the hops, uh, unless it's a flavored beer with an additive. Uh, hops come in a bunch of varieties, uh, and the particular kind, or the part of the hop that matters is the flower, so it's just the female hops that we get these things from, uh, and yeah. And then, of course, yeast. So yeast is a single cellular organism. It is magic. It is completely magic. So you give a sugar solution to this yeast, and it turns it into alcohol. It's wonderful. Human society depends on this first of domesticated animals, yeast. So with those four things, you go through a four-stage process. You mash. So mash, how many in the audience have ever made porridge? Anybody made porridge? Anybody? Hands? Hands? OK, so, so that's, that's, that's mashing, right? So all you do. You take your cereal grains, malt mostly uh, from barley, and you soak it in hot water. And the temperature you use matters, but well, it don't matter too much. Uh, and while you soak those grains in water, you activate some chemical processes that turn starch into sugar. And you have to do that because yeast can eat sugar, but it can't eat starch. And you want alcohol, and so you have to feed your yeast. So you mash it. And then after you've mashed it, you boil it for an hour, maybe an hour and a half, depending on the beer style. And while you're boiling it, you're achieving a few things. The first thing is that you're knocking out a bunch of proteins that'll make your beer not taste as nice and not keep as well and be a little cloudy. Nobody wants cloudy beer. Uh, and the other thing that boiling lets you do is it gets off some of the water so that the ABV will go up a little bit. Uh, and actually, there's three things. Uh, and you need it to get the hops well integrated into the beer. Uh, there's a few things about the way the bitterness happens chemically that require a good hard boil. Um, so, yeah. And then you do a ferment. So ferment is where the yeast goes to town. So once you've made a sort of really sweet, slightly bitter solution with hops and your uh, boiled syrup from malt, you throw a bunch of yeast in it, and the yeast eats all the sugar and boils up quite nicely, as you can see in the picture. Well, maybe, I don't know, does it work all right? Um, uh, so that's, that, that's the foam that the yeast makes, because yeast eats sugar and produces CO2 and alcohol, and so the CO2 makes foam. Then you package it. And the packaging, in this case, is bottles. Also, you can package your beer in a cask, in a keg, in a can, all kinds of ways. Uh, sometimes there's a carbonation that happens in the packaging. Uh, so this happens with cask ale. It also happens with uh, bottle-conditioned beer. So that, that bottle conditioning, it means that the carbonation actually happens via the process of the yeast continuing while it's in the bottle. Uh, you can also force carbonate a beer, which means you just sort of shove a bunch of CO2 from a canister into the liquid and then put it in a can or a bottle. Um, okay, so that's it. So that's, that's four ingredients and four steps, and you get just about every beer that you can think of. I say just about because if there's, there, sometimes there are fruit additives, sometimes there are weird things, sometimes there are industrial processes that have additives, but generally, for most beer, most of the time, four things, 
four steps. That's it. So that creates an extremely diverse range of beers, and there is a set of people in the world that like nothing else than to sit around on the weekend and taste them and bicker with each other about which one tastes better and which one tastes of grapefruit and which one tastes of leather and which one tastes of elderflowers. And here's a picture of, of one of these lovely souls. I, I count myself among their number frequently. Um, so the thing about these people uh, is that we have some websites where we can sort of collect our opinions. Uh, and, and this is one of them. It's ratebeer.com. Uh, ratebeer is quite a good one. There's a few others, though, also. I'm not necessarily advocating for Ratebeer over all the other ones, but their website's quite easy to scrape, which makes it handy for the latter part of the talk. Um, uh, ratebeer has been around for a long time, and there's quite a lot. So the first thing to mention is that Ratebeer's aesthetic hasn't really changed since 2001. So uh, it looks like a website from whence it comes, which is yeah, it's, it's nice. It's quaint. So. Rape beer tells you a few things about every beer. You get a sort of basic metadata, uh, which you can hear, see here for uh, Punk IPA, uh, Brewdog's sort of core, core hobby pale ale. So you see the ABV of the beer. Uh, you can see where the brewery is located, what style it is, uh, and then a sort of nominal idea of how good it is according to the community. And the way that they express things, rather than using ratings, is a sort of percentile score. And you'll see two percentile scores for any of the beers on Rape Beer. One of them is an overall across all beers in the site, and the other one is style normalized. And the style normalized one can be more useful for anything that's not really overhopped IPAs, because that's kind of what rate beer likes. So if you have beer that is uh, simpler or darker or a little easier on the palate, the community at rate beer tends to not like it as much. And so what you'll find is you'll get beers, and actually one of the ones on the bar is one of these, that rates really highly in its style and still not very highly across all the beer, right? So be aware of style bias. So okay, but if you scroll down on a rate beer page, what you see is this lovely collection of, of reviews. And so here, here we have for, um, for Punk IPA, a bunch of 100 to 200 character reviews. Some of them can get quite long uh, that explain the beer and that also uh, split up people's numeric opinions, quantified opinions, into a bunch of different dimensions. So uh, aroma, appearance, taste, uh, feel on the palate, and an overall score. Uh, you get a date, you get the location of the user, and then a bunch of text. So here we have, for, for Punk IPA, clear, medium to dark, yellow-orange color with a large, frothy to creamy, good lacing, mostly to fully tasting, or, uh, or mostly to fully lasting, off-white head, aroma is moderate, malty, caramel, moderate to heavy, hoppy, citrus, dusty, grass, orange, citrus, uh, etc. It goes on from there. So uh, you get a lot of quite specific flavor characteristics that can be quite useful and sort of how it's presented and things like this. So um, just another example that's a different style. So this is uh, a Colonel beer from London, uh, the Export Stout, which is quite a large, dark beer. Um, also scored quite highly amongst the community. Uh, and so this beer, if we go down to the bottom, we see this one uh, treacle-like, viscous, thick, a dark brown or black beer with a cream brown head. Can't think of much to improve here. Bitter and sweet and mineral all in one perfect harmony, right? So that reviewer clearly loved this beer and gave some detail about why. Um, also, that got a 4.2 out of 5, so you understand how, what sort of critical expectations are of the community. So this slide, if it, you can make it out from here, is just the text from some reviews on that export stout. And in fact, to be a bit more exact, this is all of the text from all of the reviews for that export stout. So you probably can't make it out. I can't make it out from the stage. It's about 75,000 characters. Um, or sorry, 75,000 words. Um, and so the, the question is, if you use a site like this, how can you get a good feel for what the community thinks about a beer and what, it, what the descriptive characteristics are of that beer uh, without reading pages and pages of text, right? I mean, you can sort of do some sampling, read a few reviews here and there, but that's not very satisfying, and it may also give you the wrong opinion, right? Um, so, lots of people like, lo write lots of things about beer, and we want to get a good high-level view of all of those things. So we're going to use text processing to do that. And specifically, we're going to use a p part of text processing called natural language processing, NLP. Uh, it has no relation to the technique for understanding and divining human 
insight uh, that became quite hip amongst corporate folk in the 80s. They stole our acronym. We want it back. Um, natural language processing. Uh, and, and what that means is that people are speaking as they would, and we are trying to get the computer to understand that, or at least to have a good enough statistical model that it feels like it understands it. And in fact, most of the time, that's actually what happens because the computers are not conscious, and they're not going to rise up and kill us, at least not yet. So. Um, what we're going to do is summarize documents, and document is in quotes here because a document is just a thing that we declare is somehow related, right? So that's part of a sort of external labeling process. This clump of text here is related, and we will treat it as a single unit. Um, and so we want to summarize documents, and we want to be able to compare the documents amongst themselves. So the first thing with natural language processing that's worth understanding and where a lot of domain-specific stuff comes in is that you have to pre-process, you have to clean up all of your data. So the core step here is what's called tokenization. Tokenization is a really fancy academic word for split on white space, right? Um, so, so here's some Python code that does tokenization in the stupidest way possible. Uh, so what we're doing, we're lowering all the words, we're splitting them all on white space. Hopefully, any lang programming language that you like can do this. Um, there are other more exotic ways to do tokenization, I should say. You can, you can be really, really specific about it. So you can split, for instance, contractions. You can drop punctuation. You can ignore words. Uh, you can do all kinds of fun things with your character sets. But the simplest and most straightforward way is just split on white space and take every individual word as a unique token. Um, so. Uh, you can use a toolkit in Python called NLTK that does slightly more uh, exact tokenization besides just white space splitting uh, with, as I say, punctuation splitting and uh, removing uh, contractions and things like this. Um, um, and so then the other thing that you can do in a preprocess is you can declare a bunch of words that may be common but are for the particular purposes of your language processing not actually relevant and are never going to be. And this in language processing is called stop lists or stop word lists. Um, and so for English, uh, you can do things like put the and 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 uh and I and he and she and we and it and things like this. Um, it does depend on what you're doing and you have to be careful with stop word lists because if you just sort of throw a big list of words that you don't think are relevant on, you can miss some subtleties in the statistical model. Uh, but it's quite good for uh, joining terms and pronouns and things like this when you're looking for descriptive text. Uh, fine. So we do all of that, and then we can also, as a last step for our particular adventure, basically do part of speech labeling, which is another fun trick, and uh, it's a little bit more complicated, so it's outside of the scope of this talk, but we're, uh, the bit of code in the slide shows how you can do part of speech labeling with uh, the language processing toolkit in Python, and then you can just filter out everything but adjectives and nouns. And because what the ultimate goal here is, is to get a list of descriptors for each beer. We don't actually care about nouns or pronouns or past participles or other parts of speech, right? Just adjectives and nouns. Um, so fine. OK, so the simplest and most straightforward of the statistical models that we can use is called TF-IDF. And TF-IDF is it's self-describing, which is quite nice. So term frequency by inverse document frequency. And so you count in two ways all of your tokens. First, you count how often a given token occurs in one document. That's term frequency. And then you count in how many documents that term occurs. And that's document frequency. You take the inverse of that and you multiply them together. So the idea here is that uh, a word that's very common, even if it occurs many times in a document, still won't get a very high weight. So if you have a word like the, and your corpus is English language documents, then the is going to probably occur in just about every single one of your documents. So even if it occurs many, many, many times in a single document, it still won't score very highly, right? On the other hand, if you have a word like, I don't know, um, brown or barley or uh, grass or something uh, that is maybe not so common across your whole corpus, it's only in a selection of documents, but in this one document in front of you, it occurs hundreds and hundreds of times. Well, then that document is probably talking about grass. So to put it all together in a standard sort of workflow, we take in a document from the web, a bunch of reviews about beer, and we pre-process them, 
And then we count the term frequencies per document, and we count the document frequency across all the documents. And then we get TFIDF scores for all of our beers. So let's walk through an example real quick. So here's a kernel export stout. You may recognize it from earlier in the talk. Here's a picture of it poured. Some nice, nice head. It's good. Uh, so here's all the text you also may recall from earlier. So once we push it through our entire process along with the full corpus, what we end up with is a bunch of pairs of words and scores. And the scores are going to vary from 0 to 1 unless you do some normalization. And so this beer, the kernel export stout, is 0 0.157 coffee and 0 0.116 chocolate. And I'm not going to read all the numbers, but it goes on. So it's coffee, chocolate, black, dark, licorice, espresso, cocoa, brown, bitter, and smoke. And in fact, there's about 10,000 words that all have scores. Uh, these are the top 10. Um, uh, so this gives you a much faster and easier way to sort of appreciate what the beer is about than having to read 70-something thousand characters of people's reckons about Colonel Export Stout London 1890. Um, the other thing that pops out to me, and perhaps this sort of ages me specifically, but so we have a bunch of words and we have a bunch of numbers attached to words in pairs, and that's giving me a flashback to my early web browsing. And here is a word cloud of all of those words. So because I don't know about you, but whenever I see words and scores for words, I just want to put them in a word cloud. So we've done that. And so you can see that here, you start to see the relative weights of the terms. Um, so it's mostly sort of coffee and chocolate, and then a couple of coloring notes about black and dark liquids. So that's fun. OK, so but the thing about this is that the computer is not clever. Remember, we're, we're performing bits of statistics to trick the computer into tricking us that it has any idea what's going on. It does not understand. It's just counting. Um, so this word cloud has a bunch of overlap of ideas that are expressed in multiple words across all the people. So for instance, espresso and coffee. These things, they're different, but they're very similar. Uh, especially amongst all the other words, right? They're not quite the same thing, but they're very close. And here, for instance, is black and dark and brown, which are all color terms, and especially the refining color terms, right? So dark doesn't exactly tell us the same thing as black, but they overlap the same sort of space of concept, right? Uh, similarly, we've got cocoa and chocolate. I don't know enough to understand the difference between those two words and their usage here. So what we can do is a thing called topic modeling. And topic modeling adds a separate process where you look at the whole corpus of your text and you count how often words occur with other words. So you're looking for co-occurrence. Uh, and this allows you to pull out words that are commonly used together. And that's, that's what are called topics here. So um, the computer still doesn't know anything about language or about humans and how we talk to each other. But it, it's sufficiently good at counting that we can count in lots of ways. And then it's better at pretending it knows what's going on. So, so also, uh, we can spell it in an American way, and we can advance. So instead of doing the TFIDF process, uh, where we pre-process and do term counting, and then we do uh, document frequency counting, we push all the documents through, and then we count co-occurrences as a separate process that happens in advance. And then we get a bunch of topics. Uh, for most topic modeling methods, and indeed the one that we'll talk about specifically in a second, um, you need to specify to the algorithm how many topics are expressed across the document. So the model is going to look for, say, 100 topics in your document or in your corpus, or 200 or 50 or whatever. Um, and there's some side effects for picking different kinds of values for that, but uh, that's a detail that we'll have to skim over. Um, so this can be refined as well. So you can add a new document to the corpus and sort of make your topics a little bit more accurate. And when we say accurate here, uh, sort of it's the idea of how correct is it that two words are going to occur together in a given document that the system's never seen before. So if we have chocolate, is it very likely that we'll also have cocoa in a document? Uh, and, and that sort of idea of accuracy can get refined uh, with more, more bits of document. Fine. So if we do this with all the beer reviews, what happens? So we get a bunch of beer topics. So here are the top five terms from three topics. I don't know if you guys can read it, but what we've got here, the first topic is chocolate, black, coffee, dark, and roasted. And the next topic over is smoke, smoked, smoky, peat. And the third topic is citrus, hops, grapefruit, orange, and pine. So 
So the first topic is basically talking about a particular flavor you're getting off of the malt, right? So dark malts are imparting these, these chocolatey tones and a little bit of the color effects from that same clump of things. The, the second one is, is clearly smoked beer, peat being a common source of that smoke flavor. And the third one is uh, a collection of flavors that you get from hops and indeed a hint that that's what's going on because hops is also included in that topic. Um, and they're also all relative terms, right? So in the smoke-related one, the, um, the percentage of likelihood uh, associated with that word is quite a bit higher than, for instance, peat, because not all smoked things come from peat. So a document in this sort of worldview is described, rather than a bunch of words, it's described as a bunch of topics, which can then be made up of a bunch of words. So we have a mixture of topics, and that's a document. So how do we do that? So we are going to use a thing called latent Dirichlet allocation, which is very fancy sounding. It's got three, three words. One, the middle word is a guy's name, so you know it's fancy. Um, so a Dirichlet is a statistical tool that is, is basically, it's like, so you have a bucket, right? So here's, here's our, our color visualization of a bucket. The bucket has four colors of stuff in it, right? Um, and each of those things has a percentage of occurrence, right? So 45% so of this bucket has blue squares, and 24% has pink squares, and 18% has black squares, and 13% has white squares. Um, so that's a Dirichlet. It's basically just assigning ratio values that all add up to one. And so the idea is that by describing these things, we can assign probabilities to unseen things we draw out of that set. So latent Dirichlet allocation is simply a method of assigning all those values, given that I have no idea what's going on inside this magical black box over here to the side, right? So um, uh, informal. This is really informal. I need to take an aside and tell you that I'm telling you things that are not quite mathematically correct. But basically, what you do is every time you draw a, where's the slide? Every time you draw a piece from the Dirichlet, you learn a little bit more about its contents, right? So if I know that there's a bucket of balls and the balls are different colors, and I pull one out, I know a little bit about this. If I pull two out, I know a little bit more, and I can just repeat forever until I have perfect information about the contents of the bucket that I can't actually see all the contents all at once. Um, fine. So if we go back to the kernel beer that we started this talk with, and we get all this text again, and then what happens is we get some topics. So these are the top four topics for the kernel export stout. And what we've done with this is we've pushed all of the dark beer flavored things into a single topic in the front. So instead of having about 40% of the words that showed up in that word graph, uh, or in that, in that word cloud rather, um, it's just it's a single topic and we have a percentage associated with that topic. And then we have two or three other topics rather that are not quite the same that were things that were missed in the previous method. So the, the second topic, for the, I'll just read them for, the, uh, for those of you who can't quite make out the slides. So the first topic is uh, dark brown sweet fruit raisins. So it's not the sort of coffee espresso notion of dark like we saw in the example. It's more of a, uh, like a rich um, sort of dark, dark fruit like, like uh, prunes or figs, this kind of, kind of dark flavor. And then you have uh, a fruit topic that goes fruit, peach, tropical mango, apricot. And then a hoppy topic that's bitter, pine dominated. And then a topic about presentation, uh, pours nice, head sweet aroma. So this is a, an interesting collection of things that actually says that rather than just being hit you on the top of the face with roasted notes, what you actually are getting here is a sort of deep, dark beer with a lot of uh, sort of aged fruit notes, right? A lot of, a lot of prune notes and things like this, which I think is actually more accurate given this beer, but I'll let you guys find a bottle of this and make your own decisions. So to go back, we have these four flavor ideas. Can we map these four flavor ideas to topics in our corpus? Because topic models as an exercise can also tell you quite a bit about all your documents, not just about specific items inside of your corpus. So we have water, or sorry, I'm gonna do it in the wrong order. We have hops, hops is citrus, hop, grapefruit, orange, pine. Malt, which is uh, caramel, amber, malt, sweet, copper. Yeast, banana, clove, bubble gum, bubble gum. And then water. Now, the thing about water, golden, white, grassy, light head. So this is a bit of a reach. The thing about water is that the flavor you get from water is flavor you don't notice. So if everything goes right with your beer, those flavors are going to get 
shoved somewhere else. They're going to get credited somewhere else. Um, you only really notice your water profile when your beer tastes of sulfur, uh, which is not something you want, or when you're just in case anyone thought that was a good idea. Um, or when your beer tastes really salty, which unless you're drinking a really obscure style from northern Germany is also not something you want. Um, so so the, the water style, the, the reason why I've tied this topic to water is because this topic describes uh, a lot of characteristics from uh, Pilsner beers. And Pilsner beers used extremely soft water profiles. And if you get the water profile wrong, the style drifts entirely off. So if you see beers, they're described as white and golden and possibly a little bit grassy, which is a hop, a hop note for that same kind of style. Uh, if your water profile is not basically extraordinarily soft, it's all going to go wrong. These are not beer styles that you can make with groundwater from basically anywhere in England, for instance. Uh, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to round out the talk with some practical and some timely information. So this is the beer list at the Robot Arms. The Robot Arms is the pub that's right over there, right over there in the tent, like it's like four tents down. It's where the beer is at camp. So, so this, as of yesterday, are the beers that are either on right now or will be on at some point in the next three days. Um, these are the ABVs of these beers. Also important to know when you're sort of calibrating your, your drinking sessions. And these are the top three terms uh, that are associated with each of the beers. So uh, I'm just going to go through them because we've got a little time. Uh, so, the Pegasus, so we've got three beers from Milton. We've got the Pegasus, which is amber and bitter and apparently a little mushroomy. I don't know. It's the internet. You're going to have to go with it. Uh, so the Milton Justina, soft, floral, peachy. So in contrast, even though these two beers are both nearly the same ABV, this beer is going to be more pale, so sort of blonde, a little floral from the hops, right? So then we got the Milton Minotaur, which is a mild. And it's got a pretty standard profile for a mild. Coffee, dark, mild, brown. So this is brown more than black. 3.3%. Uh, Tring Ridgeway, which is a session beer. So it's session nutty amber. And the Tring Moongazer, which I don't have the review data for because I had to throw this together speedily. And the Otter Bitter, which is a fruity session amber beer. The Castle Rock, which is a fruity golden grapefruit beer. And Beck's Veer, for those of you that like that sort of thing is pale and golden and watery. Again, I take no credit for these words. And the Staropromen, golden, floral, and metallic. Um, so uh, with that, um, I'm going to pause. Here, in fact, I'll go back. You can all take your notes. And um, I'm happy to take questions. I think we have about 10 more minutes. Start with that. So the question was, how do you review or how do you deal with negatives? Uh, and and the example was, it's not hoppy or it's not golden. Um, so the 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 sort of first first answer is that that's probably the hardest uh, sort of part of this kind of thing. Um, and in this particular case, I can get around it because of the nature of the data. Um, if you if you look through the beer reviews, it's very uncommon for people to describe beer in the negative. Um, it does happen a little bit, but because it's not common and effectively what we're doing is taking a bunch of averages, uh, it sort of goes out in the wash in this particular case. So it's not a problem I encounter in this data set. Um, there are some methods. So some of the things that you can do with topic modeling will start to suss out some of the negation. Um, so if you find, because it's rare that someone's going to say in a sort of 50-50 split, uh, not hoppy and hoppy for, just for different beers, right? What's far more common is that certain words get negated. And if that's the case, then what will happen is that will get pulled out in gathering topics, or can. And I, again, I mean, the, the way you deal with negation, because it's quite difficult, tends to be less generalized. So it tends to be that you're going to uh, use something that you know that's particular to the domain, right? Um, and in this case, it's because we care mostly about adjectives, and we know that people are generally positively describing. Okay, so, so the question was, uh, we're working with a quite narrow domain of beer, and how do we do topic modeling for a general, for a larger domain, like the whole of English language, for instance, yeah? Or something. Something bigger than beer. Beer is quite big, but yes. So I think um, topics are almost always useful 
no matter how much sort of generalization they're doing, right? So the, the work that a topic is doing is effectively going from every single word is its own little animal to 100 or 200 slightly more complicated statistical models that then you can do some things with, right? And so how well it works depends on how much work it's doing. Uh, but it's always going to be helpful. So if you have the whole of English and I don't know, there's 100,000 words or 200,000 words across all of your documents and you're reducing that to 200 topics, say, so then each topic on average is covering the space of uh, what, like 100,000 100, words, right? So, sorry, that's, bad, that's poor math, 1,000 words. Um, and and so, so it means that your topics are going to be broader. So here in beer, we've got topics that talk about hops and topics that talk about uh, amber malts and topics that talk about adding smoke. And if you did the same number of topics on analysis of a corpus of, that comes broadly from English, maybe you'd get a topic about beer. Or depending on how broad the, 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 the corpus is, you would get a topic that talks about alcoholic beverages, right? Um, and so, so it's a matter of, of what, what detail you'll see and how quickly you can do analysis and how, how well you can measure inter-document distance. So one of the things that people like to do with topics that doesn't quite fit in this amount of time is that you can actually measure how close two things are. Um, and, and that works really well with um, fewer topics. So uh, maybe 50 or 100. Um, and there's some, some mathematical reasons, but basically the, the smaller the number of topics, the more accurate that distance measure is going to be. Uh, but you lose sort of semantic understanding. You lose an, an appreciation of what each topic means. So the, the underlying math to do distance between um, documents doesn't actually depend on the topics being understandable by people. Um, but then you can use the topics in a different way, uh, and then you get that out of it as well. So. More questions? We have like five more minutes. Surely there's something else you want to ask me? No? Anybody? Anybody? I've stumped you all. Yes. Oh, one in the back. Yes. Um, okay, so, so the question, the question, and I hope I heard it over the, the windy tent correctly, was what sort of aspirations do I have for this? Where do I see natural language processing going in general or just with beer, both? Okay. Um, so, I mean, horse ebooks, I guess, is, is a good answer for this crowd. So I think um, the thing about natural language processing is that it's quite powerful, but what it doesn't do is teach anyone about language. So I've... I've, I've hit, I hit on this point a couple of times, um, but no matter what it looks like, the software doesn't understand speech, right? The software, it's like when you, uh, when, when people get beaten by computers playing chess, they're not playing chess the same way a human plays chess, right? And there's a sort of, it's a, it's a loose analogy, but it's, a, it's, it's a roughly analogous, right? Where, where basically you're, you're giving some software tools to pretend like it knows what's going on, right? And I think one of the ways where you can see this is if you look at the sort of the flip side of natural language processing, which is called natural language generation, where you get, um, so in this case, you would get the computer given some beer to tell you a sort of prose review about the beer, right? So instead of just a list of adjectives, we would get, you know, the beer initially drank with a bit of straw and had a medium mouthfeel that closed into a bitter long finish that was great, I'd like another, right? Instead of a list of straw, bitter, amber, golden, right? And what you find with most of those systems is that they tend to be highly rule-based and with skeletal structures somewhere in their system. So it's very hard to get uh, basically a computer to improvise. Uh, and you just sort of make it complicated enough of a fixed system that it feels like improvisation to humans. And I, I mean, to me, this is the kind of thing is, can we, can we build sufficiently complicated models that the software actually understands enough to sort of pass Turing tests and things like this, right? Um, yeah, so I don't know. That's, that's a good beer, beer conversation, I suppose. Um, okay, more questions. I have five minutes, apparently. So, 
I mean, hmm. Well, I think I think it depends. Like like all people who care enough, I'm going to say that it depends on when. Um, I I would probably start with either the Justina or maybe the Otter Bitter, and then go from there to one of the two Amber Session beers, uh, and then maybe a mild. So probably probably the Moon Gazer, even though we don't have the data for it. I don't know. It depends. The um, the thing I will say is that. Um, one of the things that's really nice about doing this kind of analysis for beer is that it's a really good way to figure out what is more likely to satisfy your interests and your tastes without having to drink a bunch of beer first, right? So if, if I know what I'm after, I can look at a list like this, even if I'm not familiar with any of the beers. So if I, if I want to start with a blonde that's reasonably low ABV, and it's quite, quite hoppy. So I can tell you from this list, and I think I've had two of the beers on this list before, but I can tell you with a pretty high amount of confidence that it's either gonna be Justina or the Otter Bitter that are that sort of beer, right? And if actually what I want is a beer that's kind of like that, but more aggressively hopped with sort of aromatics in the front and maybe the sort of new world big big hop that you get, it's, it's gonna be the Castle Rock Harvest Pale. And in fact, the difference between the Castle Rock Harvest Pale and those other two beers is quite clearly in the hop aroma profile. Um, and if you see a sort of list of 10 instead of a list of three, this becomes more apparent, right? So they're similar in the words that you see describing malt, um, which are mostly color related or sort of uh, bread and cereal kind of words. Uh, but then the words that are used to describe the aroma are wildly different. So you get sort of uh, softer words uh, around the uh, Justina and the bitter. So uh, the Justina, for example, has peachy up here, right? Um, peachy is a very soft kind of hop uh, uh, note that you get in, in beer. Uh, and then down here you have grapefruit for the, for the Castle Rock, which is a, a sort of key trigger word for big American hop aroma. It's used quite commonly, right? Um, so yeah, I think maybe that's, that's my non-answer answer. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Uh, uh, so, so the code base that does all this analysis lives in a GitHub project called consume underscore our beer. Um, and there's a link to it as part of the slide deck. So if you go to the link that the slide deck is on, which I tweeted earlier and I'll push around a little later as well. Um, uh, there's just, it's a GitHub project uh, that does all the scraping. And in fact, I have an SQL dump of all the data that's already processed, which I will happily give you if you come and talk to me. You can have, it's a couple gigs and you can do whatever you like with it. Um, yeah. Chris. Um, so not any companies that are commercially viable. Um, uh, so, so I had a go at making a product uh, for a variety of reasons that didn't quite work. I think Chris already knew that answer. Um, uh, I, think, I think there are, there have been some attempts um, uh, actually, so in, 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 I'm trying to think if there's anything that's, that's actually viable in beer anymore. So the closest thing that you get is some of the social network uh, kind of recommender things that happen around, around beer. So like Untapped, for instance, although it doesn't really leverage its data very well, it does a really good job of collecting a lot of data. Um, um, yeah, and then also there's a, there's a wine app that does similar things called, called uh, Vivino that actually is a little bit better about its handling of text. So um, it solicits, and I think part of this is because wine nerds tend to write more. Um, so there's, there's just like in a sort of broad and stereotype making kind of way. Um, so they're, they're both, the, the, the two apps are quite similar except for that one just deals with wine and the other deals with beer. And uh, Vivino has a big, big free text field. And, and Untapped is like, give us 20 characters if you feel like it. And so the result is that you get things that are sort of closer to the sort of length of reviews. And it's quite hard to do a lot of these techniques with very short text, because a lot of it depends on words occurring next to each other. And that is just gonna work better with longer things. So, but Vivino does a quite good job of pulling out, uh, this one is a Bordeaux that's gonna be quite a full-bodied thing, or this sort of thing. And I'm not sure of which techniques they use, but they're clearly doing some language processing uh, server-side that does some of this sort of stuff. Um, yeah.
Um, I have not. There is uh, some quite hilarious scholarly work that uh, has looked at uh, comparing commercial price points and social descriptors, um, and also uh, commercial descriptions. So there was um, the study was originally done with wine data about 10 years ago, um, where basically they looked at the commercial description and the price and determined that, and also uh, like uh, expert reviews, so like sort of numeric scores, you know, did Wine Advocate give it a 90 or an 86 or whatever. And they found no correlation between price and the uh, review score, but they found a strong correlation between the average word length in the reviews and the price. So, so, and that's the commercial, commercial reviews, so like what it says in the back of the label. So the expensive wine, they use big words, but it's not necessarily any better, was the like, broad takeaway from this review. Um, uh, I have spoken with a friend of mine about doing similar kinds of analysis with beer. The, the market for beer is a bit different, so, so the, the price variance is very small. So I think with that work, a decent amount of the effect comes from the edges. So really expensive wine gets really flowery language and cheap wine people describe as it will get you drunk, right? And, uh, but, but with beer, because the outliers are much closer together, right? Like the sort of cheapest beer you can buy is, I don't know, a 12 pack of something awful for five pounds. And then the most expensive beer you can buy, like the most expensive beer you can buy is 200 quid. And that's a really expensive beer, right? And there's like two of those. And so, so because the, the possible price is a lot narrower and most beer is just a couple of pounds and that's just it, uh, I don't know how much you get that commercial kind of correspondence. Um, yeah, and then the other thing that you could do is is if you compare the commercial description to the social descriptions, um, my suspicion is that in most cases they would all agree. They would just be using different language to talk about the same kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it would be interesting to see if that's right. I don't know. I mean, without without sort of running it, you can't you can't tell for sure. Um, yeah. Anybody else? Cool. I think I'm out of time now, so that works. Thanks very much, guys. What now? Which one? Ooh, could I? This one's fine. This is my Twitter handle. If you follow me on Twitter, I'll, I'll tweet all the links in a couple minutes.